I had the first chance to meet with the team this morning. Uh, thought it went well. Great to see you guys and uh, meet people. Just, you know, try to, uh, try to let them know what I'm about, what my expectations are, what they can expect of me. And um, thought that went really well. Look, you know, I got to earn their trust. There's no doubt about that. I'm not uh, trying to diminish how important that is. That's going to take time. That's not going to happen in, in one meeting. So, uh, but I felt like it went well. Um, looking forward at my expectations for them. Solid week of practice. Let's get after it. I thought the walkthrough was really crisp on both sides. Um, and and uh, that's kind of where we sit. Um, trying to think of anything else I need to touch on. Oh, um, Parks Frazier will be the play caller. Uh, just put that out there. I think it was, I think it was leaked about about ten minutes after uh, after I had the conversation. So you guys are good. Appreciate that. You know the Rooney Rule. I'll be honest with you, it's an important rule. I, I, I do not diminish it one second. Right. I, you know, I, I believe and understand fully why it is as important as it is. Right. I, I don't. I don't minimize. I. Don't, I mean, this is this is important. My role here is for eight games. When this is over, they will do an exhaustive search and, and pick whoever their best candidate is to be the head coach of the Colts. If I'm considered, I'd be honored. I have no idea where this thing is going to go, not even a little bit. And I'm not, but I can assure you that's going to be handled. That, 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 that from the organization's perspective, from my perspective as a man, like I'm, I'm, I'm good. And here's the deal. Everybody talks about my, I'm completely comfortable in who I am as a man, bro. I know I can lead men. I know I know the game of football and I'm passionate about it. I have no fear about are you as qualified as somebody else, bro. I spent 14 years in a locker room. I went to the playoffs 12 times. I had, I got five dudes in the Hall of Fame that I play with. You don't think I've seen greatness? You don't think I've seen how people prepare, how they coach, how they GM, how they work? I mean, one Super Bowl's been to two. Like, here's the deal, man. None of us are promised a good job. I may be terrible at this. And after eight games, I'll say, God bless you. I am no good. I may be really good at it. I got no idea. But I dang sure ain't going to back down. I can tell you that. <laughs> hey, Jim. It's like I said last week. I'm going to say it again this week. I always tell young journalists, because there are many, many in our business who have uh, unfortunately made things up. You know, the Stephen, uh, Stephen Glasses of the world, uh, Jason Blair, they made it up. They were journalists who were charged with telling a real life story. And instead of telling the real life story, they made up something, some imaginative, creative story. And you don't have to do it. First of all, uh, you, you lack integrity uh, and character if you do that. But also, you're spending too much energy on things you don't have to spend too much energy on because real life is always more interesting. You just go to real life and talk to real life people and you have your story unfolding for you right there. I've talked about this uh, for a couple days straight. I need you, Jim Trotter, Hall of Fame voter. I need your perspective. I, lo I would love to hear what you have to say <laughs> about all things Indianapolis Colts. Oh, man, where do we begin? Uh, um, first of all, let me say this, uh, full disclosure. I've known Jeff for years. We've golfed together. We have broken bread together. I think he's one of the finest men I know. He's principled. He's passionate. And if I were ever going to be in a battle, he's somebody I would want to have my back. So having gotten all of that out of the way, I, I, I hope Jeff has success from a personal standpoint from our relationship. Now, Setting that aside, this whole thing is is a farce. It is a joke. But let's go beyond. I mean, we, we always hear about meritocracy and, and you've got to earn it. You've got to earn it. Jeff hasn't earned it. I mean, that's number one. We right. can agree on that. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to go to a larger point for me, take this in another direction. You know, I, how many times have you had, as we talk about racial equality and whatnot, how many times have you had white people say to me, what can I do? How can I help? And so when we talk about advocacy in this situation, I have to say disappointingly that Jeff is not an advocate because for me, this is the way I view it. It's easy to say you support something when it doesn't impact you, right? Mm. But the minute mm. that it impacts you, 
What are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to sacrifice? And in this case, Jeff could have said to Jim Irsay, you know what? I'm not the most qualified man for this. And there are others who are more qualified. They may be white, they may be black, whatever, but there are people who are more qualified than me. To me, that would be an advocate because we as blacks don't get the opportunity that he just got. Now, you can say to me, I live, I'm live. i living in a fantasy world. I'm being naive here. Who would ever mm. turn down an opportunity like this, right? I'm going to give you yeah. a name. Jo Josh give McCown. A, name. a couple of years ago, the Houston Texans, Jack Easterby, and Cal McNair. Judges? Had a judges? I, had a, I, I, I don't... That's a judgment. I don't know if he turned it down. Let me let I'm me not let sure me take turned it down. Let me take the story one step further. I'm not saying he okay. turned it down. He, let's go with this. So when his name surfaces as being interested in that job, I texted Josh because I was going to be very critical of it. And I said, I just want you to know ahead of time what I'm thinking. Can we have a conversation about it? And Josh and I had like a 45 minute conversation. And in that conversation, what he said to me in part was, I said to them, I'm not the most qualified for this job, that there are coaches you should be talking to, one of whom was Pep Hamilton, who happens to be black. He is more qualified than I am for this job, and, the, and he is the type that you should be talking to. So what I would like to know from Jeff Saturday is that did he say that same thing that Jim Irsay, that there are others who are more qualified? Here are names of some of them. Some may happen to be diverse candidates, and in that case, um, what did the Texans do? They set aside Josh McCown and they ended up going out and they hired David Culley, right? Fired him after one year, but we know how that goes. So what I'm saying to you, true advocates to me are people who are willing to make personal sacrifices. And Lorenzo Neal used to always say this to me during a football season. He would say, it's easy to be a soldier when there's no war. Well, in this case, mm. It's easy Ooh, to be an advocate when it doesn't when it does not impact you. I just wish Jeff would have that's said, you know what, Jim Mercer, as much as I love would love the opportunity, I'm not the most qualified for this. Okay. Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting that's interesting. That's interesting. So my first thought is exactly you you, you read my mind and read the mind of a lot of people listening to us on Sirius XM channel 85, watching on Peacock TV, uh, YouTube. Wherever, wherever you listen to podcasts, you read, you read our minds, and that is, nobody would turn that down. If you, if you're presented with that opportunity, you have to go, right. go, go for it. Okay. All right. Next up, maybe some people, some people would turn it down, or maybe you think of where can I make the biggest impact to get my message across. In other words, Jeff Trotter, uh, not Jeff Trotter, who, uh, Jeff Saturday, Jim Trotter, could have done exactly what you said. Could have turned it down, had a private conversation with Jim Hersey and said, nope, I'm not the man for the job. Hire somebody else. Why don't you give it to John Fox? Why don't you give it uh, to Gus Bradley or somebody else on the staff? Because I'm not the guy. Or he could be here in this platform. He's speaking with the media constantly. And how powerful would it be if he is now and the eyes are on him and he gets to make that statement publicly? If he were to do that, so is it better to turn it down and give somebody else these eight games and we never know we never have that powerful moment of somebody saying, hey, look, I was presented an opportunity and I turned it down. I guess he's got the ESPN. He had the ESPN platform. He could have done that. Absolutely. But I think if he does it here, if he does turn it down, that's pretty powerful as well. I don't know what's what's the better way of doing it. Just to give up the job. I mean, I, I think my my no, scenario I, maybe I, is more realistic. So are you saying maybe. are you saying he so are you saying he takes the interim job and then goes public and says, you know what, I'm not the right guy. I'm trying to understand after, be clear on after, this. Do, after doing it, after being in that opportunity, after doing it, because I, I just feel like Jim Oh no, 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 no. Wait, hang, hang on now. If nobody's he, gonna if do he that. takes the Right. Well, Nobody's if he takes the interim down. job, if he takes the interim job and then he is offered the permanent job, in theory, you would think that means that he that they did, they succeeded or he did a good job in those eight games that he was coaching the team, right? 
Mm -mm. Is that what you're saying? Nope. What do you say? Nope. You know what I'm saying? This is what I think. A couple things. One, I think Josh McCown, even after your 45 minute conversation, if if the McNairs had offered him the job as Ursay did to Saturday, you're the guy for the job. Not that we're going through it. Hey, hey here the job is yours. If he had been given the job, take it or leave it. Here's a contract. Sign that. I think he would have taken it. And, and the, um, what we heard the name Josh McCown, just like you did, you heard the name and then you responded to it. It was not a done deal at that point. It had leaked out that they were looking at Josh McCown. And the, I think a lot of public pressure made them go in a different direction. That's when they brought in David Cully for a year as a placeholder. He got a raw deal. And then they were looking in another direction again. I think they wanted to go back to McCown. More pressure. Brian Flores adds them to the lawsuit. They bring in Lovey Smith. Right. Okay. But I, if McCown my, had been in the position of Saturday, if he had been in Saturday position, I got to push back a little. I, I think if come Josh on, push, McCown, come on, come on, come on. That's why I know. Here. I know. That's I, why we're here. I believe that if Josh McCown truly wanted that job two years ago, truly wanted it, I believe he would have had it. In 2020, I believe he would have had it. Yes, I believe in 2020, the so-called remember who, so -called was, year remember who was running the reckoning? club. Remember who remember who was running the club then? Yeah, Jack Easterby, yeah. who had the ear of Cal McNair, and they were making yeah. some really bizarre decisions. Just the fact that they would bring up Josh McCown as a legitimate candidate at that time for that job tells you they weren't doing thing in a traditional manner with that organization. I believe I have nothing to nothing to confirm it or, or to say that I'm actually that that it is 100% factual but I believe that if Josh McCown had truly been offered that job and truly wanted it I should say in terms of understanding what that was going to mean in terms of how he was going to be perceived among the men that he was going to be working with that the job would have been his I, I, I believe that I believe the Texans yeah, well, were that dysfunctional at that time Here's the other point you when you said hey, I'm in my scenario was Saturday, you know, taking the job at, at an interim basis and giving up at the end of the year in my scenario. He's done a good job. No, I think it's I think it's just the opposite. I don't you know what I think Jim. I, th I hope I'm wrong. Tell on me. This. I don't think I am. Tell me. I think if Jeff Saturday goes one and seven. The job's his. I think the job's his. Mm. I think Jim Ursay wants to give him the job and you oh, can no tell question. from the pre you can tell no from question. the press conference where he says eight games, hopefully more. Hey, he Absolutely. I'm glad he doesn't have experience all that stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Jim Ursay is is going to give him the job because let me ask you this. When has Jim Ursay brought in somebody and not given them more than a year? They, like, they no, give, I, I, this is what he does. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I, so, there's no question he wants to give him that job permanently. Well, and, question. And, he, and you know, he here's the other thing. Here's the other thing, Jim. They didn't think it through. They didn't think it through, or maybe they did. But I'm going to say they didn't think it through. That hey, I'm going to go out and get Saturday. I'm going to get Jeff Saturday uh, the job, and we can start. Uh, we can get a head start on the 2023 season. And I really don't believe. I'm not calling the man evil. Let me just make it clear. I'm not saying that this was some some sinister plan from Jim Irsay, but they weren't thinking about the Rooney rule and hey, you can't do this and you got to go through the exhaustive search. So he's kind of standing there when he's asked a question at the press conference. He's a little flat footed. Then he starts talking about his record. Hey, wait a minute now. I'm the last guy you should be questioned about the Rooney rule. You know, I, I, I had Tony Dungy and I had Jim Caldwell and this organization has been fair. We've had black coordinators on and on. I don't think he thought it all the way through. This is the plan. The plan is to have Jeff Saturday be the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts for several seasons. I think it would be powerful because I think Saturday might go one and seven or two and six. It would be powerful after that happens or to step up and say, you know what? You know what? I was given an opportunity and I, you know, frankly, I didn't deserve it. 
I'm not qualified. No, for that'll it. never happen. Will never happen. Will never happen. Will never. Well, happen. I guess both of them would. Both of them would never happen. Nobody's gonna turn down the job. <laughs> yeah. No. And, the only and, way that and, Jeff, if I know Jeff Saturday as I think I do, the only way he would ever walk away from it is if he felt truly that he couldn't make a difference with the men he was coaching. I, I believe that. I believe I that in my heart. Difference. I think he'll in make a difference. I, I like the way you started off by talking about him. And I said this a bit yesterday that I think a lot of people are struggling with the conversation on this and, and really pointing out the deep absurdity of it because of the respect they have rightfully so for Jeff Saturday. He's a guy to know him is to love him. He has really sure. got an easy way with people. You, you he's he's relatable. You can connect with Jeff Saturday very quickly, and you know that. And so, sure. yeah. I think he'll make an impact from a de- just from a human being. There are some human beings you come across in your life, uh, d- d- despite what, no matter what industry you're in, just their pure humanity and their decency has an effect on you. Whether they're good in the roles that they're placed in is a different story. So I think you'll have an impact from the decency and integrity that. That that is that, yeah. that is just flows through him. But, but I'm trying no to understand way. what that. Im- but what is that impact you're talking about? What impact is he going to have? Frank Reich was a decent man. He was well liked. Right. He's respected yeah. as a human being. So what's well, the yeah, difference? But, that, but, but Jim, Jim, I'm not dismissing that. That has nothing to do with. Well, I shouldn't say it had nothing to do. They're judged by wins and losses. So Correct. the public. What I'm saying to you is the public doesn't care. You, you think I'm, 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 I'm mounting a defense. I'm not. The public doesn't care that Frank Reich is a decent man and an ordained minister. Correct. What Correct. they care about is he won one playoff game in five years. Correct. I'm saying inside the locker room, I think the players do care that both things can be true. I care about you as a man. You didn't necessarily take us where we wanted to go, but I'll never forget the relationship that we had, that's an impact. It's not all football. I mean, there's real life involved too. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I think Jeff Saturday will, relationally, there will be an impact. The bottom line will not be affected. I think they're gonna win a couple of games, maybe. Maybe they'll win on Sunday against the Raiders because they stink too, but. I, I think you're being kind when you say a couple of games. I don't know that they'll win a couple of games. Here's the other thing um, that you got to take into account, too. It's not just that Jeff was hired, but now in the promotion of the play caller, right? You take a 30, 30 year old guy who has never called plays before in his life. You've already fired Marcus wow. Brady and whatnot. And so the first major decision you make as the interim head coach is that you're going to promote this guy. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, Michael, there are people already internally looking at that situation sideways. So again, well, I, of course they are. Jeff, That's why Jeff Saturday is one of the finest people I know, and he will have an impact relationally. But in terms of football, as you say, it is a bottom line business and they are not going to win with, with him there. And the other thing, look, Jeff is right. He knows more football than I, he's forgotten more football than I will ever know. So he can step in and and know the X's and O's and how to relate to guys and all of that. But you know this because we've had this conversation. Being a successful head coach in the NFL involves so much more than that. So much more. We see guys now who get in there, first year guys, whatever, and even guys who, who, let's say on their second try. Game management, it's easy to sit back on our chair and say what we would do in certain situations and act like we have all the answers. It's another thing when you're in that fire and that play co- clock is winding down or you got all these different things coming at you. And again, you've had no training as a coach, not as a player, but as a coach in those situations. I just don't see where this can be successful. I really don't. I, 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 that's why I love, I love that uh, line from my friend uh, Terry Francona, Tito, manager of the Cleveland Guardians. He, he always used to say, because he spent some time uh, a c- couple different stints away from the dugout. He said, the farther you get away from the game, the easier it looks. Absolutely. He said, he said so th- he said, sometimes that's even in the stadium. He said, so, you know, he used to work in Cleveland's front office back in the day. He went from the dugout to the press box and, or the suites. 
He said, even you're in the same stadium and you played the game and you've managed the game, it looks easier the farther you are away from the field. So uh, there's a long way. I don't know how many miles specifically there are between Bristol, Connecticut and Indianapolis, but it's longer than you think. And I know that, you know, Saturday you know, had these conversations on TV about football that he played. He did it on TV. He's had conversations on TV for nine years about various teams. And uh, I love this note from uh, Ben Volan from the Boston Globe where Saturday was on the air on a radio station at 930 Monday morning, breaking down the Colts Patriots game. <laughs> Uh, as a as a media member and then a couple hours later he's a head coach so like that that it seems easy oh i do this and oh, the offensive lines a mess they need to they're not doing this right they're not doing that they got the wrong scheme then you get in there and and it's a completely different story but i want to address something you said and this is why and, I think, and, but let me let me say this real quick too the other thing that bothered me in all this that bothers me in this whole process is if what chris ballard says is true this is even more troubling because he said in the press conference that they had reached out to Jeff a couple of times about being on the coaching staff previously. Yeah. And Jeff yeah. declined those offers. So what kind of privilege is it that you say, you know what? I got no interest in being your assistant coach and whatnot, but when you want to make me the top guy, that's I'm right. good. That's right. What, kind, that's what right. kind of privilege is that? Right. Hey, hey by the way, what kind of contract did he sign? How much money are you making? I don't <laughs> That's know. what I want to know. What's his contract like? I mean, look, I always say it's easier. It, it, I mean, look, right here, it's easier in the studio. You sit there in the studio, you're not getting uh, yeah, the hours are pretty good. You got a producer in your ear. You got the lights. You, they can get your good side if you have one. All the things, you know, perfect conditions at all times and then you break down the game and we'll spend so much time talking about the game and then you go home. It's so much easier than doing it. It's easier. So they must have enticed Saturday. It's not just the love of the Colts that got him out of that studio and got him to Indianapolis. But I want to say you, you talked about, oh, he, he, he hasn't. He's made some decisions. And he's looked at sideways in Indianapolis, but he's not looked at sideways. Nobody looks at you sideways when they're looking top down. What I'm saying is all the decisions right. that have that he's made are coming from Ursay. So right. Ursay gave us a hint. He says the coaches are scared. They're driven by analytics. Okay. So he really right. bashed every coach on his staff. And look what happened. He's bashing I, I, like the, the name. Go He's got two big time uh, coaches on the staff. One, one big time. John Fox been to the Super Bowl, didn't win it, but been to the Super Bowl. Oh, he did win it. He did. So Fox, Fox Super Bowl winning head coach. Been to two. Yeah, been a With couple two different, Bowl, teams. Two different teams to the Super Bowl. Okay. You have Fox on the staff. You have Gus Bradley on the staff. He goes outside the organization. He brings in Saturday. Saturday names the assistant. Quarterbacks coach. Quarterback coach. Yep. Yep. As the play caller. So in every opportunity Ursay had to go with what was there, he went outside. He could have gone with the, the, the quarterback coach. Nope. You're not going to call plays. Could have gone with one of these former coaches. Nope. You're not going to be an interim coach. And this is what I said this yesterday. The biggest tell that Saturday really has the ear of Jim Ursay. He says Sam Ellinger is his quarterback. How do you know that? Why? Why? Why is that? He's not the best quarterback on the team. He's the most convenient quarterback for what the Colts are trying to do. But he's not the best quarterback. Are you kidding me? You come in a real interim coach will come in and say, I haven't made any. I need to see these guys in practice and I'm going to go with who gives us the best chance to win because we're three, five and one. We've got eight games left and we still got a shot. No, he didn't say that because Ursay doesn't want him to say that. Anyway, let me say this to you. Man. You like you like famous lines, and I know with Michael Smith, you guys will do that pop culture at times with famous lines from movies. I'm gonna give you a famous line that Marty Schottenheimer once gave me, and and you have the same respect for Marty that that I, oh, I do. I love Marty. Um, Rest in power, Marty. 
Marty, if you remember back in 2004, Drew Brees was coming off a terrible season, and the Chargers went out and made the draft day trade to get Phillip Rivers, fourth overall pick, right? So we go through training camp, and all of the veterans on the team believe that based on what they saw, not training camp, I'm sorry, in the offseason, what they saw in the offseason, that Phillip Rivers was going to be the starting quarterback over Drew Brees at that time. Phillip ends up holding out, can't get a contract done. So Drew starts the first game. They go down to Texas. I'm sorry, to Houston. They win, but they don't play well, but they win. And so Marty has his press conference on Monday. And I go to see him. And I said, Marty, you understand that that you could cost yourself your job here, you know, the way this thing is going. And Marty said this, and then I'll give you the second thing he said to me I'll never forget. He said, Jim, if I'm going to F it up, I'm going to F it up my way. And he stayed with Drew Brees, and they ended up going to the playoffs that year. The other thing he said to me is he said one, the lesson he learned from his one year in Washington was that ownership has its privileges. And Jim Irsay mm-hmm. is showing us that ownership has its privileges. He doesn't care what we think he doesn't care what the league thinks he doesn't care what his coaches think he doesn't care what his locker room thinks he cares what Jim Mersey thinks and that's why he went out and got a guy that he relates with that he likes and again Jeff is a great guy smart guy passionate guy yep. strong in his convictions yep. all of those things and Jim Mersey said you know what meritocracy doesn't matter um, fairness doesn't matter. All that matters is what I want. And it's my team, so I'm going to do what I want. And he did what he wanted. And we'll see how it turns out for the Indianapolis Colts. I think, uh, Jim, I do think they have a great matchup on Sunday. You're right. the Raiders. You see my two, feet. Two, two struggling, <laughs> struggling teams. Uh, and, and the Colts may have a little more bounce than the Raiders at this point. I'm, I'm, fat, I'm glad I'm going to the game. I'm glad I'm going because I want to see this up close. Oh, and you're wondering what's going to happen to you day to day. I, I saw a story and uh, I, I want you both to weigh in on this because it's just, I just imagine anybody in this position would just have to be terrified where you look at your life, your own life, you're an individual and you are now a political pawn uh, in the back and forth between the U.S. and Russia. And uh, the, the story I saw was the Vladimir Putin, I didn't want to make a decision before midterms because he didn't want the appearance of giving Joe Biden a victory. So, th- I mean, this is all playing out at a level that has nothing to do with the human being here who is... Uh, being unjustly held in another country with no end in sight. Jim, I know it's a, it, I know you're both are passionate about this. Jim, uh, you first, then Natalie. I want to get your opinion on it as well. Uh, Jim, what are you thinking? No, I think you covered it well. The reason I put it at the top of my feed is that it's very easy to become numb to this or, or to forget about it. Um, but this is a real human being. This is a person who has a wife, who has a family, um, and we shouldn't forget about her. As you say, she is a political pawn in this game that's going on right now. And the thing that concerns me is that, as her wife had said previously, she felt that she was being forgotten by us over here. And and so from that standpoint, that's why I put it at the top of my feet after, you know, you read that that she's being transferred to a penal colony is, man, let's keep talking about her. Let's keep this on the front burner um, because... Man, it's it, on a human level. It's just so, um, it's just devastating, you know, that she has to go through this right now. So that that's why I put it at the top of my feed, and I think you covered it very well. Yeah, I mean, my heart kind of sunk when I woke up and, and saw the news. So it's just really devastating, and. It, you feel helpless because there's not much more we can do besides continue to talk about it, send letters. You know, we have the ability to send letters. There's different things that we can do to show support if you're a praying person, pray. But it is, it's 
uh, just a very devastating situation. And she's not the only one being held, but she's the biggest name being held. And so, you know, that this is taking so long, you know, the whole, the goal is that eventually she will, you know, they'll be able to get some kind of deal to happen, but that this is being delayed. Like you said, Michael, for things like Putin not wanting to make it look like he's giving, you know, Biden a win. It's, it's just gut wrenching, you know, I can't imagine what her family is going through. And so I just continue to personally keep them in prayer. Yeah, eight months. You know what? I mean, eight yeah, months. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really crazy. And, and, you know, since we, since I mentioned the midterm thing, it's, it's difficult uh, for, I think this is, this is why a lot of people are, are, are kind of desensitized to use your word, Jim, to the whole political process because they feel like their voices, their their organic voices are not being heard. There's so many people who have uh, a stake in this. So the politicians have their own ground that they're trying to protect and they will talk about things that are uh, politically expedient to discuss. And then there are people who are giving money, they're big donors. So because they got money, they get their agenda in there, they get their platform. And, and I think in some of these uh, political conversations, you know what you'd like somebody to say, wait a minute. For example, uh, you, you guys are talking about all these issues. How about this? You have people who haven't had uh, kids in school for 30 years talking about what's happening in our classroom and they don't even know. Okay, you got all these, all these people who are talking about, oh, this is happening. You don't know that. You're just, this is a talking point for you. But let's get beyond the talking point. What would you do, person, political person, political candidate, what would you do about this situation? Well, a, an American citizen is being held unfairly, unjustly held. What would you do? How can we like these are real life issues? I know, you know, so the economy is a real life issue and the price of gas and real estate's too high, but also this because if you put yourself in this position, anybody, no matter where you stand politically, this is terrifying that you could just go. You could be in another country no matter how you feel about what she did or, you know, you're in another country and you think you're going home and months later, you're still in that country and nobody's telling you what's going on. That's the real, I mean, that, that's the real politics. That's the real stuff that we want answers to that, uh, that I don't, you're right, Jim, enough people aren't talking about it. So Brittany Griner is a basketball player. Let's switch over. I know it's hard to talk about, trivial things like basketball here, but we'll switch over and talk about basketball. And uh, Jim, you put something in your feed and I want Natalie to answer. Uh, you had a question about the dubs uh, and, and the dubs uh, being in trouble. And I just, uh, you tell me, you tell us what you meant and I, I'd love to hear Natalie weigh in on it. See, first off, I know what you're doing here, Michael. I know you're trying to get a rise out of Natalie. You know, because I heard the whole light skin brother conversation and whatnot. And you're trying to put me in the middle of it. And you're trying to get me nah. to get her going on this. I didn't, and, I didn't and mention Kevin Durant, I, did I? I didn't mention Kevin Durant. That's what, getting Natalie, that, that's what gets Natalie going, Kevin Durant. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't know that part, but she and I have already spoken on the Warriors. So, so we're good on that. The reason I say are they in trouble is this. Look. I understand that when you are the defending champion, everyone is going to come at you. And I understand that that Steve Kerr is now trying to, um, with so much depth now, trying to create rotations and get some of these young, figure out how to utilize these young guys. And the hope was that they would win while doing this, and they are not. When I watched them the other night against Sacramento, knowing that they were coming off that road trip where they were winless, and then knowing that they had finally had some time to practice and whatnot, I felt that they would come out strong, and they did. The problem is they couldn't sustain it. And so I'm really trying to figure out where, and, and Natalie can speak to it, where Steve Kerr is going with some of these rotations. You know, you don't play James Wise, Wiseman at all. At least I don't remember seeing him come off the bench in that Sacramento game. And he is a guy who is going to have to produce for you later in the year or once you get to the playoffs for you to get to where you want to go, I believe. It's nice to see he finally put Jonathan Kaminga back on the court because that is a young guy who belongs in the flow um, and, and to get minutes and learn. So when I say is the reason for concern or is there trouble, it's more of the stuff that I'm seeing, the big issue I have with them, is just defensively. 
they are not able to close out clubs or quarters at times like they have done in the past. And and that's my biggest concern, Natalie. Yeah. Um, I don't think Wiseman is actually going to be a player that's going to be able to help the, the Warriors. And I think that's the glaring issue. Um, it's still very early in his career, and I can't say that he's not going to improve as a player. But the skill set and what he brings to this team doesn't really fit with the Warriors. And so part of the reason you have him playing for a while and not Jonathan Kaminga is because there are some politics going on, right? Like ownership doesn't want to look wrong. There was a lot of noise around whether they drafted the wrong pick when they went with James Wiseman. So there's this push to like put him out there and kind of like center him. And it was happening at the events of Jonathan Kaminga because the two of them operate in the same space on the court, right? And so that's part of the problem. Um, and then, you know, it's not being talked about, but you had Dante who went down and he he was kind of the player they brought in that would be like the GP2 replacement, not like one to one, but he's a good defensive player, brought you some more on the offensive end, and you lost him very early in the season. So you're rolling out these all bench lineups, you're asking Jordan Poole to carry those lineups and to now become more of a primary playmaker secondary scorer and that's not his natural fit that's not what he's comfortable with so you see Jordan struggling he's not able to carry that second unit and the bench can't score right so that's part of like what's going on there and so the the, the starters still have the best net rating in the league by a large margin right. but they right. do need their bench to be able to come in and play the defense is a real thing so I'm not like dismissing that at all but he's going to have to shorten the rotation they're probably going to have to play smaller than they'd like which is not something that they wanted to do but I don't think it's going to work with James Wiseman and they're going to have to figure that out soon see you know I think what? it has I'll to work with him and the other and with the other thing I'll say this so real quick Michael is yeah. I don't think he can shorten the rotation because there's a there's a they have run a lot of tread off those tires with those players from because of all the success that they have had when you start adding up all those playoff games it's almost like they're playing another season more than than other teams if you go back over the last five six years whatever so i don't think steve can give those guys you know step and we know clay you know with the, the injuries that he had and and even if you watch draymond now he's not necessarily the same guy i don't think he can shorten the rotation because I, I don't think those guys will last until later in the year he doesn't have to extend their minutes, but he also doesn't have to go 11 guys deep. You know, you give Moody more minutes, who's shown some promise. Right. You play Jonathan Kaminga more. You have more consistency with those guys instead of kind of yo-yoing around the, the young guys. Hopefully Dante comes back soon. And maybe you're just going nine deep, 10 deep instead of 11 deep, right? And so that's what I'm saying. Like, it, it's, it's not working. We've seen multiple combinations with Wiseman, and he's the issue. It's him. It's not anybody oh, else don't say that yeah. don't say yeah. that oh, oh don't I'm, say that. hey you know what i'm sensing i'm sensing a generational <laughs> issue on the warriors old guys yeah. versus young guys chaos yeah. oh, in the yeah. locker room that's what's happening yeah. but you know what I'll, I'll take any day any day if the warriors uh want to move on from jonathan wiseman i take them on my team and kaminga james wiseman yeah. i'm sorry james wiseman and jonathan kaminga i take either one of them either one of them Give those guys 30 minutes somewhere and you'd see uh, some big time results. But I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to ask you guys this. Wiseman's going to uh, be a star, I believe. I, I think Kaminga. I think Kaminga is going to be. Oh, no real. question. I love Kaminga. No question. I love No, him. both of them. Um, both of them. Uh, so I'm going to ask you guys. Uh, I look at some of the surprise teams in the league. Uh, the Jazz are clearly one. I thought the Jazz would be terrible. They have the opposite record of what I thought they'd have. The Blazers are also surprising. Natalie, are you surprised by the Bucks? Not their talent. Obviously, they've got Giannis, and he's tremendous. But they're not doing that. Hey, we're going to do a nice little, we're going to pace ourselves, and we will crescendo right when the playoffs begin. They've gotten off to a torrid start. Are you surprised that they've started the way they have? No, I mean, that team is like a machine at this point, like very Spurs-like, right? I mean, they, they, they play a certain way. 
they've been playing together now for a couple of years, few years with like their key pieces. So they have the continuity. So even though, you know, Middleton is out, they can still play together. So, and then you have Giannis, right. And he's arguably for some, the best player in the league. So, um, what is it, Michael? <laughs> okay. For some, arguably, we're talking about comma, the bus. We're not talking about who for I think some, is the best player in the league. The best player in the league. I got it. Yes, for some. But I mean, look, it's a very, like, I'm not going to be mad at anyone who thinks he is. And so uh, their start doesn't surprise me at all. I think he's going to be out for tonight's game. So they might get their first loss, but they may still win. Like, that's how much of a machine they are, right? And so um, the Bucks are a very good team. And I think right now, don't kill me, Michael, but you may have to consider them the best team in the the East, I do think them and the Celtics are a tier above everyone else. And I think those are your top two teams in the East. And, you, you know, Michael, you know this. I, I talk a lot about culture. And mm -hmm. and when your best player is your hardest worker, you've got the right culture. He sets the standard for everyone. And Giannis is that type that regardless of how good his numbers are or what he puts up, he always feels he can do better. And I love that about him in terms of what that does for the other guys on the team that they can never relax, you know? So I'm with Natalie on this. I, I think that there is a culture there where there's a certain expectation about how you're going to perform and how you're going to play. And and they're doing it. And they're not even fully healthy right now. So yeah. I, I, want I you... agree. I I don't see anyone right now beating the Bucks coming out of the East. I, I want you both to uh, give me a, a number. Give me your pissed off level from one to 10. If you had, if you were in that situation, what was the game? And Natalie, you remember this. Uh, I, I think it was a game over the weekend. The Warriors didn't play Steph, Clay, Draymond. Uh, and, and then Steve Kerr came out afterward and said, you know, fans would be wise to check out the back to backs or look at the <laughs> older teams and to see that, you know, maybe you shouldn't buy tickets because I'm like, man, I ain't doing it's like that Steve Harvey bit when they say, you know, put your hands up, turn around and be like, look, man, I don't want to help out. I came to the concert. I just want to sit and be entertained. Right. Don't ask me to do all this work and show my work. Is this math class? Like, give me your pissed off level if you were at that game and you didn't see any of those guys play. One to ten. Oh my gosh, 10, I would have been tight, you know, but like as 12. an avid basketball fan, I would have been, yeah, 12. like, I, I, like, because I follow the league so closely, I do avoid back to back, but fans should not have to do that. They shouldn't. Well, especially when that's the only the one time that they will come. That was their, you know, wasn't that their one trip there? What is it? Yeah, the Pelican? Yeah, like, oh, maybe. Come <laughs> on. He's like, he, he, he tried to say it in an intellectual way too. Fans would be wise to. Hey, man. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.